So what we're going to do is just ask each of our four panellists to do a very quick reflection. I'm going to give them a maximum of 10 minutes. That's going to be actually like a lifetime to people who are used to summing up the world in 140 characters to uh, their perspectives on how uh, Twitter, other social media are changing the world of policy making. And then we're going to throw open the discussion and the debate, not just to all of you, but also to all those people following the hashtag of of hashtag media and gov, which I think is impossible to type, but no matter, we're lumbered with it now. So at media and gov, and the roving mic of Jake is going to be shouting out questions that emerge there, so we can not only have a debate in the confines of this room, but also with the wider uh, Twitter sphere out there if anyone is watching us. Um, so without further ado, and having almost ceded his right to go first by being disorganized, it's an utter delight to introduce Tom Watson then, please. Thank you. And before I begin, I would like to say that David Babs and Alberto Nadelli have the two most amazing pair of shoes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> oh, his win. Yeah, Alber <laughs> Alberto's interest in fashion trumps, uh, trumps us politicians. So look, I'm going to talk to you about as a practitioner. I'm not an expert like these three. And, but I will give you some insights into my use of social media, particularly Twitter, both as a minister and as a backbench MP, and now head of cabinet MP, which I'm still getting used to. Firstly, I want to say the classic mistake that politicians make when they use any form of social media, a self-publishing platform, is A, they forget that it's a self-publishing platform, and therefore is, uh, they're on record in perpetuity. But perhaps more importantly, they, f they think that it is a broadcast medium rather than a uh, dialogue med uh, a medium of dialogue. And I see Twitter in particular as a giant listening tool. And I can honestly tell you that when I was a minister in the cabinet office, not a day went by <coughs> where I didn't use the community of people I'd built a relationship with on Twitter to give me insight into the job I did. Now, admittedly, it was a little easier because I had a particular interest in uh, digital policy and tech policy, and I think the sort of people who use Twitter innately uh, also shared that view. It's a bit harder if you're into reform of pensions to use Twitter to listen. Uh, but th then again, y there will be communities out there that can do that. And it gave me great insight, and essentially, that is because humankind likes sharing knowledge. And so I strongly believe in the serendipitous nature of the hypertext link. I've said it before. People give you bite-sized chunks of information and insight, links to articles, ideas, creative sort of uh, creative people who want to come up and give you sort of help in the job you do. And you can eat, and you can, and if you've got the right community around you, they provide you strength and sustenance in a difficult ministerial job. The insight I'd give you, uh, now my, my experience of social media changed when I went to the back benches and when I was taking on a, an, is an issue that, frankly, the mainstream media had chosen not to report, despite it being newsworthy, obviously that's a hacking scandal. And what I found then was that I did actually, I was able to use social media as a, as a distribution network to get out news and insight that was valuable to many people that they were not getting in newspapers. I think that was a, perhaps a unique experience because we've got a kind of bond of a murder between newspaper editors and what we did have in the UK where they sort of had a, uh, an agreement not to report bad news about each other. I think that's been broken now. But I do think that that was actually, it was social media that played a role in breaking that kind of rule. and. There were some big people who had big followers who actually got um, important facts and stories out about the hacking scandal in a way that they couldn't have done, they wouldn't have been able to do 10 years before. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, I will say that for the politicians amongst us, what social media gives you is really important, uh, the, the, the ability to organise really quickly. And so it's already beginning to affect Parliament. Just look at the way the petition system is used as people form groups around policy issues with very low barriers to entry. When I joined the Young Socialists many years ago, quarter of a century ago, you had to book the room, print the leaflet, draw up the distribution list, 
get the telephone tree, get people to the meetings, put, order the coach. Now you just set up a Facebook group. So it gives you the ability to organise really quickly with low barriers to entry. That's my insight. How's that? Tim. Okay, thank you. Um, it was very unnerving because I was listening to Tom and I'm sort of watching <coughs> your eyes out there, looking up and down, and <laughs> wondering how much you're focusing on Tom's words of wisdom and how much you're focusing on what you can see um, behind us. But I shall uh, struggle on despite the eyes moving up and down. Um, the first thing I'd say sort of generally about um, social media and then a few specific remarks about Twitter is I do think this is, we are at the beginning of what is an enormous moment in our politics. Uh, up until the internet age, we saw a huge centralization of power and <coughs> uh, a monopoly of the conversation held by a very few politicians and journalists um, in Westminster. You know, ever since the sort of broadcast age uh, dawned, conversation ceased to be local and meaningful at a local level. Everything happened um, in Westminster in our own uh, society and they controlled the conversation. If a newspaper wronged you or wronged your community, perhaps two or three days later, you know, you might have some sort of right of reply. Uh, that transfer, that, that, that monopoly is gone now. The idea that columnists and commentators could make uh, remarks that were unchecked and then scrutinized, that's gone. And I think at the moment we have seen one of the monopolies broken, which is the monopoly of, of comment and opinion. Um, but that is only the first of the monopolies that this, this revolution is going to, to, to break open. And I think you know, we will see others go too. And I think David, you know, the, the 38 degrees is at the forefront of one of the next um, monopolies to go, which is the monopoly of party organization, the monopoly of campaigns being run by a few bodies. I think 38 degrees is showing that the masses out there can organize in a, in a new way, can fund adverts that can be put in national newspapers, uh, blend in with different kinds of media. And so I think we are seeing the monopoly of organizations broken. And I think that some of the things that are left, particularly in our area of, of politics, um, are the monopolies of fundraising, and the uh, monopolies of candidate selection. And I don't think it will be too long uh, before we see the internet uh, driving and creating incredibly different, uh, incredibly responsive um, political uh, movements. And um, I am not an expert in the technology. I am someone who just finds it fascinating as a cultural phenomenon. And it's, it, it's that which I think is the, uh, the template with which I look, uh, look at all this. Suddenly it is millions of people have the power to publish and be noticed. And that has huge implications that, that we don't fully un understand. Specific to Twitter, which I see as sort of part of this uh, phenomenon, um, the, you know, the paradox of Twitter is that it's 140 characters and therefore is supposedly this very trivial thing but actually, I find this thing Tom was sort of suggesting, the link to material, I find it the richest of media. I mean, you can get into communities of very specialist people. My friend Stephen Shakespeare from UGAS loves the whole science of the brain. And he is now connected through Twitter with all the most eminent, thoughtful people on this. And he is able to see all the latest research and, and technology. And, and as Jill was saying at the beginning, you know, my interests are our football, our, our politics, um, uh, our certain Christian things. And through Twitter now, I can have in a list of links something more specialist, more interested, more suited to me than anything I could get from a, from a, national, from a national newspaper. And that, 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 is, that is fascinating. I find Twitter now for a live event whether it's Prime Minister's question time, uh, whether it's TV's question time, whether it's a Labour or Tory leader's speech. And I, I follow about 400 people, and I find between them, I get more accurate and insightful comments than, they, than I can in following any other event. If it's a controversial goal like 
uh, penalty yesterday in the, um, in the Sunderland Wolves game. You immediately get lots of uh, expert knowledge. If it's Ed Miliband's performance at Preston time, you immediately get all these incredible observations as to what he did right and what he did wrong. And this sort of richness of information, I think, is its, is its huge uh, quality. I, I, I find uh, Twitter now is the uh, second biggest driver of traffic to um, conservative homes after the good old BBC, um, and it's, it's, growing all of, it's growing all of the time. I don't think it replaces blogging. I think blogging is still <coughs> a longer form media, but I, uh, neither are they in competition. They're very much complementary, mm -hmm. which is sort of why they, they drive traffic um, to to, to one another. Uh, and for those of you not particularly you know, used to Twitter, you know, it is not a media that you have, to part, you, know, you have to contribute to in the sense of lots of people I know don't tweet very much, they just read and, and, and consume. And I think how different people use it is, is, is entirely up to them. And I think probably most people just do, do read it rather than broadcast. David. You've been mentioned here. Um, we decided to have a look at some of the uh, recent 38 Degrees campaigns in preparation for that. So <laughs> they've got uh, Save Our Countryside, Don't Ruin It With a Building Free For All, which is about the National Party Policy Framework, 118,000 signatures. Save Our NHS, which only has 495,000 signatures. But I think our favourite one was, but it wasn't quite clear what the output was supposed to be, was a minister just called you a zombie with 91,000 signatures. So <laughs> anyway, David, your, your new mobilization, the new frontiers of politics. Mm. So. I'll, I'll come on to the zombie thing. I, I think I'll, I wanted to start there just with um, the disclaimer, really. Often I find myself on these panels as, as kind of one of these new organizations expected to say, I think, that social media can kind of replace parliament. Um, to me, policy by Twitter alone sounds like mm. a pretty dystopian future. And I, I think a lot. you often find, I think, that practitioners who are actually using this stuff are much more realistic about its, its applications than often the particularly the journalists who write mm -hmm. about it. Um, Twitter, I think, still is a minority pursuit, but yet is, still, is also simultaneously, paradoxically, engaged with new people in politics. And I guess that's because it's less of a minority pursuit than politics and policy are at the moment. And also, I think there's something about its kind of more elite select nature that makes it... Um, mm -hmm both uh, po politicians kind of feel drawn to it, I think, but also because you're, com you're competing with less people in that space, so it's much more possible to attract a politician's attention than, say, it, say it is via Facebook or, or via um, email. Um, one of the things we were asked to think about as a panel um, w was what Twitter, what role Twitter could play mm. in the 2015 mm. election. And I started trying to think about that, and I realised if we'd been having the same conversation in... 2006, before the, the same distance out from the 2010 election, we'd have been thinking about MySpace. So it's really interesting with these technologies how, how fast they move. And for that reason, I, I wanted to talk more about what I think are the most significant aspects of social media phenomena more generally. And some of these have been alluded to a bit already. Um, I agree with a lot of what Tom and Tim have said, but just to lay them out more in a, a little more detail. Um, I think what this, this process that that Tim was des describing of how politics has become more professionalized and more centered around elites, I think is particularly accelerated in a 24-hour news climate where um, traditional civil society simply couldn't keep up. So a development would uh, emerge um, and the, the process of a policy outcome would be navigated and negotiated by the political classes and the media classes. And what I think social media and the internet has enabled us to do is it has enabled ordinary people to catch up, to organize things in real time, but catch up with that process. So it's kind of, it's the people's old answer to spin in the way that spin was politicians' answer, answers to 24 hour news. Um, secondly, um, I, I think the, the process of lowering, lowering entry costs to, to campaigns, to ideas, is really significant. It, it allows new organizations to, to, to launch insurgencies, to get involved in the political process. But it also allows new ideas, disruptive ideas, to, to get in a fraction of the cost they could before. So, for example, in the case of 38 Degrees, we were able to interrupt a conversation that was taking place between government and um, 
conservation charities about how Brit England's woodlands would be privatised with a disruptive idea that you shouldn't privatise them at all. Um, and suddenly, all the people who traditionally would have relied on channels of communication but wouldn't have given them that option were able to cluster around 38 degrees where they voted for it as a campaign and then donated to run it as a campaign that took part in polls to decide what kind of campaign we'd run. And suddenly, suddenly the government was standing up in Parliament and apologising and changing their mind. I think similar things are going on with, with some of the stuff that Tim's involved with on Europe, where the political establishment has a kind of sense of what the stitch-up should be, and traditional media has that view as well. But, but it's harder to keep a lid on that stuff now. Thirdly, and taking a different tack perhaps on, on this, um, one of the things I think is really important for social media in terms of civil society is I think a healthy civil society... Um, and this isn't a kind of ideological point. What it just citizen, an engaged citizenry will engage partly through, or should engage through authentic relationships with, with other citizens. Um, people you know anyway, people you live near, people you work with. And the, the atomized nature of the society we live in has meant that that's kind of broken down a lot over the, over the last 20 years. And often people who are engaged in politics have their political mates and their normal mates. That, that I can see a few people kind of nodding in recognition at that, at that experience. Things like Facebook and Twitter and that enable you to share your thoughts, engage in a conversation with all your mates, with, with your family. And that, that, I think, is quite powerful. And that's how 38 Degrees has, has grown so fast. And that's why we've engaged nearly a million people, because it's spreading through people's normal social relationships, people pressing forward on emails to their address book, sharing it on Facebook, tweeting about it. I guess the other angle to look at this from is how are politicians responding? How do, what, what's this disruption looking like? And I think this is going to be a process which is navigated. It's creating tensions, and it's going to be something that's navigated and negotiated over a number of years. At the moment, I'd say the, you've got a mixture of enthusiasm and, and outright hostility, often within the same people. So most of our politicians are Democrats. They, do, they are excited about the idea of people being able to con con connect with their elected representatives, even if they're not necessarily as enthusiastic about it as Tom is. But at the same time, I think elites are used to engagement with civil society being mediated through venerable old pressure groups, venerable institutions who are fronted by people who fe look and feel a lot like them and sound a lot like them. And this unmediated contact is something which uh, is kind of neatly threatening and, and disruptive and unreasonable often. At the same time, on a more practical level, politicians see all the opportunity for voter contact, for enhanced data, for opportunities to tell, find out what, what issues their voters care about because they hear, about that, hear from them via the 38 Degrees website and go back to them with information about all the amazing things they've done on that issue, in a, especially in the run-up to an election. But then at the same time, they are faced with an increased workload, often demanding skills of them which they haven't developed yet or don't want to develop, and offered IT systems prov provided by their party or by parliament, which are lousy often, inadequate, can't, can't deal with it. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, what we're seeing from 38 Degrees is that probably the bigger dividing line in terms of how politicians are engaging is not about ideology or party, it's two other things. It's age and length, length of time in parliament, and it's the safeness of your seat. Um, those are the factors. If, if you're young, and you're, you're in a marginal, you're going to be engaging with these things and welcoming them. If you've been in Parliament since the 1980s and you're sitting on a big majority, it's a bit more of a hassle. And I think that, if you're looking for explanations as to why Simon Burns in a safe seat in Chelmsford, who's been an MP since the 80s, referred to 38 Degrees members who are contacting him and other MPs about the NHS, but why he called them zombies, I think those are the major explanations as much as any ideological difference we've got. So I, my sense is that the big battle, the big thing that all of us, wherever we are on the political spectrum, need to engage with here is how you navigate this tension going forward. Because I, I, I think what the floodgates have been opened, and there's no, there's no te the only way you could close them again is to artificially raise the barriers to people getting in touch with their MPs. And I don't think any of us who believe in democracy think that's a good idea. We, we need to recognise that there are practical challenges, there are issues raised by the fact that, um, that there are, are increased levels of voter expectation and interaction with their MPs. But we also need to recognise that the kind of people who engage with their MPs using social media via 38 degrees 
were the kind of people who were using the 38 Degrees Facebook page and Twitter page to organize riot cleanup, not riots. And that's why, ultimately, I think this is a good thing. OK. We give the first round's last word, not the last last word, to Alberto. As we said, Alberto uh, tweets in his own right, but Tweetminster, uh, which he's co-founder of, uh, describes itself as, if you don't subscribe to tweet, tweet, Tweetminster already, says, a media utility that connects you to the influencers, trends, and news that shape current affairs and UK politics. Also available on iPhone. And soon so on iPads. So if you, what? <laughs> on iPads soon, too. On iPads. All right. Oh, well, simultaneously available soon. on the same things. Oh, well. <laughs> I read a blog about Steve Jobs, but I haven't got any of his stuff. So. Seven-year-old Nokia. But anyway, Alberto, uh, your thoughts. So I want to start off talking a little bit about the context within Twitter, uh, within how Twitter has developed, especially within politics. So when we launched Tweetminster at the end of 2008, there were only four MPs on Twitter. There are now more than 315. And there were also, there weren't that many journalists and news organizations. Uh, Twitter still hadn't taken off that much within, within the UK. There were a couple of, um, there were a few MP, a uh, few journalists, a few media organizations. And the third, I think, key point in terms of context is that um, Twitter is much bigger than most of us think. Um, at the last time I checked and count, there were more than five million users um, within the UK, and the number is probably much bigger now. So it's much bigger than the people that we follow or connect with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that context element is important for several reasons. So first of all, change happened very quickly, but more importantly, <coughs> the way that we perceive change and the way that we um, engage with change happens much, much more slowly. So to, to, to give a couple of examples, I remember I was at an event once and there was an MP who I won't name who said that he will never use Twitter because people don't care what he does in the bar. The MP now tweets obsessively, especially about you. Um, a journalist during a, a, a program uh, we were on said that Twitter was a very, wasn't a very useful platform and it would have no impact whatsoever in terms of traditional media. People would still follow news on newspapers and um, television. And this journalist now tweets um, very, um, very, very often. There's, it all reminds me, there's a great story within a book by Clay Shirky, and he talks about um, an abbot and a scribe called Anis uh, Tetemi. Sorry if I read, it's very hard to pronounce. Um, and a few years after the creation of the uh, printing press, um, scribes started to get um, very unsettled because they felt that printing was going to um, put in, dan in danger what was their profession. And they were very much backed by the church, which was... Um, needed scribes to transcribe religious um, texts. So they got together and they started and they wrote a pamphlet to uh, talk about the merits of scribes and talk about why the printing press was terrible. And to distribute this pamphlet, what they decided to do was to print it. Um, I think there's a great story there. What it shows is that when we're moving from point A to point B, that journey is never linear. And oftentimes, by the time B becomes stable, A is already obsolete and often irrelevant. And I think there are several implications within that context in terms of Twitter politics and policy making. The first is the way that we perceive news and the way that people engage with issues and talk about issues have fundamentally um, changed. People are talking about politics and are talking about policy, are talking about issues across Twitter. They might be talking in groups of 20 somewhere, in groups of 10 somewhere else, a group of 100 people somewhere else. Those conversations have happened are happening. The way that links are being shared, the way that um, uh, people are distributing and consuming news in bite-sized and small chunks of information fundamentally changes the way people perceive issues and the way news is um, consumed and um, distributed. There's a great study by an American organization called Pew, and they asked young people within this study um, under the age of 30, under the age of 25, they asked them how do they spend their free time. And they ask, do you spend enough time on the internet? And the majority of people reply, no. The next question asks, how do you spend the, mo the majority of your time? And most of them say, on Facebook. <laughs> um, and the same, the, the same research asks people what news sources they read, New York Times, Washington Post, etc. The majority of young people weren't able to say what news sources they read. They said they got their news by clicking on the links that their friends were sharing. So it's a fundamentally different uh, context in terms of how people discuss issues, discuss 
policy, and it's very hard for institutions, organizations, and policymakers to fundamentally change the way they, they do things to be able to engage um, with this world. The second point, I think, is as a platform, Twitter is fundamentally very inclusive. But what it does, it amplifies what happens in the real world, the good things and the bad things. If someone makes an idiotic comment about strikers, it will amplify its idiocy. The fact that that person may not be very intelligent in the comment that they've made. In the same way, in terms of um, politics and policymakers, if you have small circles talking about uh, politics and policy um, within Westminster, the Westminster um, village, um, that the closeness of that context will be amplified by Twitter. So you'll have groups of hundreds of people, say, talking about an issue, talking about uh, policy, and people outside those circles will may not be engaging within those conversations. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't people elsewhere on Twitter and on other social media platforms who are talking about um, those issues. Um, the third key, key point, I think, is the relationship between social media and, and traditional media, I, I believe is a false um, dichotomy. There's just uh, media. And it fundamentally, the way people, when people watch television, it gets amplified on social media. When people read an article, they distribute it on social media. Traditional media gets stories, gets um, finds sources and commenters in that they uh, quote within um, so, uh, social media. There's fundamentally a news stream, and that differentiation becomes um, less and less um, important. And I think that's a key consequence. I think that there are two key consequences of that. The first is um, value is created when people can connect the dots between the offline world and social media. Twitter is a very good example um, of that. What happens around um, the ecosystems platform is also a very good example of how people mobilize and organize within um, social media to, to bring debates um, into parliament. And the other key point, I think, when we talk about internet elections, if we stop looking for a big internet event, so a politician that maybe makes a mega mistake which has an impact uh, on an election campaign, and instead start looking at the fact that the way people understand issues, debate issues, already is having a very profound impact in terms of how they behave and how they um, shape their um, political opinions. I think social media already is having a very large impact in terms of elections. Um, so I think to summarize, has Twitter changed the policy process? I think what's changed is how people engage around issues core to policy. Uh, a few policymakers and organizations are already part of this process, and many, many more need to, I think, are at the beginning of engaging with um, the policy process. Okay, I'm going to now ask Jake, Jake Lurking Around, can you just give the panel a readout of any this rapid editing? Yeah, of it's quite interesting, actually. There's more comments that. than questions, which might say something yeah. about the, the narrative that is on Twitter. Um, but there are uh, uh, one from Puffles2010, uh, what makes for a good anonymous account and what accountability challenges are raised by them? Uh, ben Lyons, number one, when will political parties recognize social media as a tool for sophisticated voter research and not just campaigning? And another one from Ben Lyons, is number one as well, does the desire to be retweeted lead to polarization, incentivizing people to tweet hyperbole? There's three to kick off with. Uh, I only got the last two questions. Uh, right. The first, well, the, the, the one that may be best for Tom is, uh, when will parties recognise social media as a tool for sophisticated voter research oh. and not just yeah. campaigning? Uh, when they lose more elections, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, look, the parties are a bit slow to this, partly because, uh, as David said, that, you know, political parties are rigid institutions with decades if not centuries of history that make it hard for them to respond to change rapidly and actually the challenge for all three parties I think is how do they engage movements that can form really quickly as I alluded to in, in what I said at the start how do they allow passionate individuals with particular interests to journey through them if that's what they want to do it's quite hard to come in with two or three issues that you see are important for a short period of time and join a political party because there's there's all sorts of things about 
place and geography and you know time it takes to do it to get involved in an organization uh, and that's the big challenge and, and actually for me we, we've, we've recently reformed ourselves uh, we've got this reframing of labor project I would like to see uh, much more granular engagement with members online much more sort of bringing policy groups together uh, to sort of share insights uh, than we already do and that's one of the challenges we've got we're going to be slower than we want to be but or slower than we want to be but that's just the way it is and the third question you said about clever tweets to get mm -hmm. retweets is probably a bit of that but generally if you do it properly you should be engaging rather than just sort of broadcasting is that all right but do you think there's a political divide on tweeting and particularly in government is there sort of inhibition on government ministers using social media. Your colleague William Hague is supposed to be the best, but even he's still a bit dull. dull. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, it's hard, I think, when you're a government minister to be uh, particularly interesting. Perhaps you're, you're, you're surrounded by people urging you to be mm. cautious, and so it's easier for a backbencher to be, to be more controversial. I think that's, that's hard to, to get around. Um, in terms of uh, the questions from from Jake, I think the I think the, the key reason why America is just so much more interesting in how it uses the internet and Twitter and social media um, is partly a technological thing, um, but it also I think is about it is about funding and how parties are financed. Um, I think so long as uh, you know, to caricature the Labour Party gets its money from trade unions and the Conservative Party gets its money from big donors. Neither of the big parties will really ever have to embrace the internet to understand what people uh, online think to raise money from them. And it's, it's that drive for me to raise cash that has made, I think, the Republicans and the Democrats incredibly internet savvy parties. Um, Alberto's point about their, you know, thinking about how will the, how will Twitter, how will social media impact the next general election? I think you know the I think he's completely right to talk about we shouldn't necessarily look for a big internet event. There might be a big internet event, but I actually think the internet impact can be can't be, be quite profound without any of us really or a lot of people really noticing. And the thing about traditional elections, you know, what I call the centralized days, is only a few issues really mattered. It was the you know the economy and it was maybe the Iraq war if there was some big foreign policy event and it was what the mail and the guide and then the times decided to write about those things. And if you know the four or five thousand people who cared about human rights in Burma, you know, their issue didn't matter. The, the thirty thousand people who cared about the privatization of some, you know, local facility, their views didn't necessarily necessarily matter. And certainly what the American uh, political establishment is using the internet for, I think, the most important uh, uh, impact is actually identifying the 100, 200, or however many they can uh, identify as constituencies that care about a small issue that will be never taken seriously by the big media, but they can reach through social media and know that that issue um, matters a great deal to them. So it's in, it's in the micro internet, internet event that the, uh, the impact, I think, is, is profound. And sorry, then I'll shut up. Mm. Just, just the point that uh, David was making about um, you know, the impact that uh, 38 Degrees has had on something like the NHS and forestry privatization. Um, I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of 38 Degrees and what they've achieved in terms of their infrastructure. It's not clear to me, though, yet, that what happened on wood, uh, woodland privatization and the NHS would not have happened anyway if 38 degrees hadn't existed. It just might have happened slightly more slowly in a, in a different way. I think when we, we will know that the internet and groups like 38 degrees are making a difference is when they find issues that the Sunday Telegraph wouldn't have campaigned on or the Guardian wouldn't have campaigned on and find something completely that the Westminster Village has, has ignored and maybe even campaign against newspapers or something. I don't know whether Tom would think that the hacking game in some way was, was part of that or got the story going. But it's easy, I think, sometimes for us to exaggerate 
the role that the internet plays in speeding up something that would have happened regardless. Do you want to come in on that, David? Sorry, David, you want to uh, I think it's a really fair point. I think the other great thing is that if you're looking at the way politics is different yeah. today and the way that citizens are more engaged and more up to stuff, there are plenty of other factors that could be driving that in terms of <laughs> massive other failures <laughs> to, to do with of policy over the last 20 years and various big scandals that have also made, you know, push in the same direction in terms of people wanting, wanting to get more, more involved. And what, what disruptive role the internet is playing, as opposed to the disruptive role of economic failure or hack, hack, the hacking scandal or the empty expenses scandal, it, it, it's impossible to unpick, isn't it? And it, it's, it's certainly too early to tell. Um, yeah, on two. So one, I think the fact that political parties are slow at changing, I think that's not limited. I think a key point to be fair on political parties is that it is a challenge for all large institutions. If you think about companies, think about a company like Kodak. I was reading the other day that in, in 1976 they had 85% of market share in the US for films and 90% of market share for cameras. Today their shares are worth about a dollar. Um, it's very hard for a large organiz organization who's always done something, measure success and achieve success in certain ways to change that on the go. It's like fixing someone, some I can't remember who, used a metaphor saying it's like changing, um, fixing the engines of a plane while it's in flight. It's very, very hard to do. I think the, the other thing is someone asked a question about anonymous mm. Twitter, mm. Uh, Twitter accounts, yeah. which I'm not sure anyone picked up on. Um, I think there's two sides. I think one, there are quite a few successful kind of anonymous accounts on Twitter. One is um, these social gurus, I don't know who it is, but it's very amusing and very funny. Um, it's a good example of an anonymous account. And I think the, the broader question is- Do you think it's really stupid? No, it's not. But I don't know, whoever it is definitely has some level of insight. And so if you look at what, they're, what they tweet about, it's not someone who's, it's not, it's not like the, the queen, the fake <laughs> queen on Twitter, which obviously there is much, much insight that comes <laughs> in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Um, so it is very yeah, funny, right. but there's clearly not... Picked not up another 100 followers for <laughs> two Twitter <laughs> gurus, but anyway. Um, I think the second key point, which is probably the broader point, is on identity and the notion of the, uh, the difference between, say, on a platform like Twitter, all you need is a, is a username, which makes the whole notion of identity very different from email or even on a platform like Facebook where you need to provide um, personal um, information. So I think it's a much broader debate around identity. Okay, let's throw it open to, we've got some roving mics, so we'll take a sort of cluster of questions, uh, short as the tips for thing. Um, Dermot, you want to say who you are? No, you get a mic. Um, I'm Dermot Finch, I'm Head of Public Affairs at Fishburne Hedges. Um, what do the panellists think is the most, in their experience, effective Twitter tactic for influencing policy, and if they can't think of one of those, what's the most irritating? Okay, um, okay we'll park that. Brian, yeah. Very brief question for the spirit of the event. <coughs> Brian Walker, Constitution Unit. I just wonder about official people and Twitter. If you're a whipped MP, a civil servant, a public service broadcaster, uh, can you, is it viable, and you touched on anonymity here, can you really have a Twitter identity which is actually yourself, and if it isn't you, you're not as interesting. Are there protocols developing which are actually anti-democratic? Okay. More questions? Yes. Hi, I'm um, tweeting as LSE politics blogger. I'm from the LSE, and I wondered if the panel thought that um, Twitter was a good tool to get, for example, academic research or ideas into the policy making process. Is that an easier way uh, for academics to, uh, or, or other interest groups, to get um, research into policy making? Do you want to plug your guide, Jane? Yeah, I've just written a guide on <laughs> academics' use of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> So, which is very good, so if you want to read that. Anyway, effective and irritating, what about these sort of, you know, people who are a bit constrained on James Smith and academics? Tom. Okay, uh, yes, I would say that actually uh, experts, learned, or people who can point you to learned journals for a topic that you find really interesting is, is ideal for Twitter. The Sarah Jefferson Institute of Architects linking to what Howard described it before. When I was involved in 
um, trying to liberate government public data. Uh, it's a very specialised area, uh, and the experts came to me and pointed me in the right direction every day. That's just a bit of that insight I was talking to you about. Official people on Twitter. Uh, yeah, you can do it. I did it as a minister every day. I mean, the two, the two things I'll say from that is, A, you can use it occasionally to sweat the system. So I remember once when a civil servant was being pulled out to drive for saying something dumb on a blog. She broke the civil service code. She ended up being disciplined. But it made me realise there wasn't actually a proper <coughs> guideline for social media uh, for civil servants. I sort of asked for a submission and a draft document that was 132 pages came back. <laughs> and so I, I said, we need to put this on one side of A4 and I stuck it, I linked to it from Twitter on a blog post. It created mayhem, but we got a sort of eight point plan. I'm sure it's been killed since I left <laughs> government. Uh, so yes, and it does allow you to find your authentic voice. I will say that that does create conflict in the system where there are sort of particular networks of information channels uh, the sort of the press officers, some, you know, panic like crazy when a minister sort of doesn't go through official channels. And so, what happens for a politician is, if you get it wrong, you don't feel as protected by the system. And so, the, they are risk averse very often because you're kind of very open. And you, you, well, you've got to get burnt a few times. You know, once you've been through that pain barrier and not worry about it, uh, you know, it helps. But some politicians are more risk averse than others. And uh, on policy, what I would say is you screeching voices on Twitter is what you ignore when you're a policymaker. Uh, and, um, and, and people who you, who you do value them, uh, you know, if they've got an authoritative voice and they come to you, if they've been engaging with you before the issue sort of becomes prominent in, in, in the public eye, then you're more likely to take them for granted. So you know, like 100 people pouncing on you on Twitter within an hour, which is, uh, you know, doesn't tend to work, but sort of just gen genuine engagement, cranking down the rhetoric is what works for me. I'm sure that's what every policymaker will tell you. And Tim will probably tell you that's, that's the advice he would give, you know, his, his group as well, I would say. So, um, you know, genu genuine engagement rather than sort of, you know, cranking up the political rhetoric is what works. Um, yeah, I agree with everything I think Tom <laughs> has uh, said. Um, what can I, I add? I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's very tough to sort of feed it through a public service broadcaster Twitter account. You know, the, 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 you know, they have to be there because it's such an important medium um, now. But you know, they're only you know, one silly tweet away from you know, me pouncing on them for being left wing and Tom of pouncing on them for being, you know, betraying their right-wing views, particularly if they sleep at night after too many glasses of <laughs> wine. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous medium. And there have been broadcasters at CNN who have expressed personal views, and, um, you know, they're, they're certainly one lost their job in their neck of the in the in the Middle East. But I don't think, you know, my name is Fred Bloggs, and I work for the BBC, and I tweet in a personal capacity. You, you know, really allows you to get away with saying anything you... <laughs> you want and um, you know, I think it's a, it's a tough thing. The most interesting thing that, that we did was uh, a few years ago was you know, on Facebook you can declare whether your political allegiance is liberal or conservative or whatever and we analysed all of the BBC employees on Facebook <laughs> and added up and found you know, that they were 11 times more likely to describe themselves as liberal than conservative. So <laughs> <laughs> now of course it's, you know, it's an artificial uh, Difficult distinction in uh, the British context, and perhaps or a more complicated political distinction compared to America. But once you know something is out there that is beyond the corporation's control, you know, this is something that can be analysed and followed. So it, it is high risk for an organisation like the BBC, which is uh, you know is, is careful with its reputation. Um, academics, I have a little list actually, a Twitter list of academics that that, that, that I follow. And um, probably should be adding other people <laughs> to it, but um, you know, Twitter means that in a way that I never did before, I know what's going on in the world of uh, political. Well, a little bit more than I did about what was going on in the world of political academia. And you know, back to what, you know, what I said at the beginning, this is I think that one of the best things about Twitter is that um, you can produce mini news feeds, incredibly tailored and special. No, no one else um, provided, and um, uh, 
dilemma. I don't think I have an answer to your question, sorry. I, I, you know, I find Twitter you know, particularly users incredibly interesting to follow for, for information, but other than a sort of a few hashtag you know, attempts at pissing an issue, I've not really seen a particularly brilliant campaign yet. Um, I, say, yeah. Yeah, I, like, um, I think the point in politicians and what they tweet about, I think <coughs> going back to the point on change, <coughs> As um, time passes, I think politicians will hopefully realise that there is great value in being in posting much more compelling content and sharing much more insight and their thoughts on issues that in the world that surround that surround them, like the majority of normal people. And I think if politicians knew how the, the, the majority of people, look, look, there are so many conversations on Twitter about how boring the majority of tweets of MPs opening something somewhere or going and holding a surgery somewhere. And that's basically the feedback of potential voters and people saying what you're posting is boring. And it's not that difficult to provide a little bit more insight and a little bit more content of um, interest. Obviously there are risks, but you manage risks with judgment politicians should have lots of. Um, and there are, I think, good examples. One very good example is the number 10 account. Until a few months ago, it posted um, fairly dry content and just linked to basically their blog post and announcement. Now, what it's doing, very, I think, very well is it's posting insights into the day-to-day -day work of number 10. And that's one of the very valuable things of Twitter, is being able to provide insights <coughs> to how things function on a day-to-day day -day basis, because media, or a news broadcast will have a polished product, an article or a 30 second clip. They won't tell you all the bits and pieces which happened backstage or as that article was being put together or as that clip was being put together. A platform like Twitter allows us to provide that insight. And if you look at the reasons why people say follow footballers or football teams, what's really interesting is the insight and the opinion of footballers between games when they comment on an issue or they comment on news. And you don't have a lot of that in politics yet. And if I think people who are interested in politics would love to see politicians and organizations providing a little bit more insight into how policies are made and how certain conclusions are um, reached within a particular arena. A very quick one on the effectiveness tactic. I think in the long term, fundamentally, it's just about posting compelling content. If you post compelling content of insight, people will engage and distribute your message through. In the, if you post content <coughs> in the long term which isn't compelling, insightful, interesting, people will stop paying attention. Do you think it's irritating? Last night you were posting very interesting stuff about the Italian Spurgeon Edward. Ed Forms and David Miliband were respectively posting on Misha B and Little Miss, who are not <laughs> the <laughs> X-Men. I was shocked to find, and I was debating whether to unfollow Ed Forms, who I then sort of following the day before, thinking, yeah. in fact, he's going to post, so I'm not going to waste. Uh, do that, and I'll just follow Alberto. It's only interesting things about what's going on. I mean, what's people's reaction to that? Do they think, oh, these people are really human, I love it? Or do they just think, oh my god, how impressive is this? I don't know. I think in some examples, I think without looking at the, the specific example, I think there are, I think lots of politicians underestimate the intelligence of people. They underestimate the fact that if you tweet from a football game or if you tweet, I'm watching X Factor, and it's not genuine, you don't, you're not genuinely yeah. interested in X Factor, you're not genuinely interested in that football game, people will eventually see through the fact that you're not being authentic. And they, they appreciate it much more when your opinion is authentic or you're providing yeah. insight into things like the economy or events which fundamentally have an impact yeah. on the UK. It's just that, you know, I, this is a, I don't know, a live issue to all of us. I'm not a politician, but in, in an electorate that I wrestle with, it's just, I used to only ever tweet about politics. And, you know, a couple of friends said to me, you seem like the most boring person <laughs> on earth. <laughs> and then, so, I thought, well, I changed my policy, and I started to, you know, watch you know, it ever, ever a few football tweets and everything. And it drives other people completely crazy. They think, we don't follow you for your views in your personal lives. It's got a, so it's, it actually is quite tough for politicians to get the balance right, because you can offend or bore somebody one way or another. Yeah. I think the lesson for politicians is that they don't, don't care. Oh, well, I, I talk. I tweet about music all the time. Not X Factor. It's really naff. But um, I tweet about music almost every day on Twitter because I love music. And um, 
you, you know, you, but that's within the context of having a slightly sort of quirky Twitter feed, I guess, over many years and mm. getting to know people. I, if you suddenly happen to be a leading politician who suddenly starts talking about how he loves his Manchester United, then you know, I guess that looks. Uh, Alberto says if it's not authentic, mm. you could catch on to that really quickly. I do. I actually do think Ed Ball does is sad enough to enjoy the X Factor. <laughs> 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 he's not watching it anymore. He's no, watching no. the Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. So I'm sad <laughs> enough to have wrecked. But anyway, so David, what about uh, Dempster's Valley? What's effective? What makes for effective? And the question on 38 degrees, we looked at a list of your successes, and 38 degrees is really good at stopping things. Mm. Is it any good at getting anything to happen positive, or is it just a sort of massive mobilising veto power lurking out there? Mm. Um, I'll come to that second question first, that's right. Um, I, it's definitely the case that some of 38 Degrees' biggest wins over the past year have been stopping bad stuff happen. Um, I think that's partly the kind of environment we're operating in. It might also point to some of the strengths and weaknesses of, of our model of campaigning, but I think we're seeing a lot of evidence um, from amongst the 38 Degrees community of a great deal of appetite for proposing things and working in favour of stuff as well. So after our big win, stopping the, stopping the forest fell off, um, since then, 38 Degrees members have been organising walks in their local woodland and events in their, in their local woodland to discuss what they would like the future of England forests to look like. Um, over 90% of submissions to the independent panel on the future of the forest, which is the government's kind of get out vehicle for cancelling their original policy, over 90% of the submissions to them were from 38 degrees members. Um, on, on the basis of that, the panel offered us a meeting to, to discuss that at very short notice in the middle of nowhere in Bentley Forest. Um, over 50 38 degrees members turned up on a Friday morning to, to meet with them and discuss with them. Um, so I think there is significant appetite for to use the internet to work together in favour of stuff as well. Just a couple of weeks ago, um, over 30,000 38 degrees members submitted to the Ofcom consultation on media plurality, like a follow-up to the stuff on uh, 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 the, the kind of hot, very hot phase of the Beef Friday takeover. Mm -hmm. there, there is that appetite there as well. It, I guess <coughs> there is a reality as well that often the internet is good for crystallising around moments, and often those moments are precipitated by crisis. Um, but I think in what we are seeing is the capacity for the community to support in those crises to then follow through and propose stuff. Can, can I come yeah, yeah. Add to that when you finish? Sorry, are you finished? Um, well, quickly on the, on the tactic thing, yeah. I was just going to say some things that we found <coughs> quite powerful are location-specific tweets. Um, so say, for example, um, over the last few days, we, our members in Chelmsford, where Simon Burns, the MP who's from 38 Degrees member from, is his, his seat, um, our members met, met up last week to discuss what they wanted to do and have got various activities planned with them using the hash Chelmsford hashtag. Um, and that does seem to be drawing in a lot of people and getting, getting quite a lot of local interest. Um, which is, I guess, that, again, it's that crossing between out of just the political mm. sphere or whatever and get it, getting at it from a community angle. Tom? I think the idea, I mean, the point you make about is it this negative or positive event? I mean, again, illustrate that by example. You know, this, this idea of bringing groups together, the, the, uh, what 38 Degrees can do is just wire people with similar interests together. I, I would hate to be Simon Burns in Chelmsford in two years' time. <laughs> just, uh, he's made a big rod for his back, and he's, he's going to have a zombie standing against him at the next election. And it's all going to be, it's all going to go wacky. Better but, than the brainstorm. But, but you know, <laughs> it will happen. I th in fact, and you talk about the trees issue. When James Pace uh, belligerently defended the sort of original position, I remember him being in the chamber, and I thought, 38 Degrees will have a campaign out against this in the next 48 hours, and they virtually did. Um, and so the sort of interplay between the Sunday Telegraph and 38 Degrees, I think, is interesting. And, and the idea that, to bring it back to social media, that MPs becoming catalysts for change is really is what interests me. I've got a running battle with Keith Vaz over video games. I play them and love them. He thinks they're going to ch turn your children into devil kids mm -hmm. and they're going to do terrible things uh, socially if they play uh, 18 digit games. And he, but he, he dominated the market uh, in Parliament on video games for a number of years, always got a page lead in the Daily Mail every time Modern Warfare came out. I'm hamming this up, by the way. Uh, but he, he, 
I, I then formed a Facebook group uh, to counter those proposals called fa uh, Gamers Boards. Within a couple of weeks, 16,000 people had used this. I booked a room in Parliament, allowed them to come and meet for the first time, and then walked away. And uh, the technology and MPs acting as catalysts brought these people together, which was essentially a negative act to complain about Keith ba Bowers beating up on them all the time. And they now go away and they lobby the industry, they go to events, they sort of share the discussions and, you know, they go, go off and do it. And that's where I think the value, that's where, what, that's what 38 degrees, the challenge of 38 degrees really is. And that's, so that's stuff in Chelmsford where you get people actually meeting up in the physical world and sort of talking about how they can play a political role, I think is important and, and missed in this, dis and very often missed in this discussion. So before I go back to questions, we just had a sort of a tribute to the... Uh, massively revamped number 10 communications effort and giving us really insights on what was going on. There's a couple of people sitting quietly over there from the Cabinet Office, which is the <coughs> Forest Group. So what if you want to just comment on this sort of problem of sort of official tweeting and actually what it's like being on the receiving end rather than on the transmitting end? Nick Jones from the, it's a joint team between number 10 and Cabinet Office. Um, it, 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 the anonymous one is a big, big, long, hard question. I have colleagues in the proprietary team looking at it. Um, I would I'd ask you to look at some academic research that I think Claire Warwick at, at UCL is doing on how you can or cannot keep your personal and work, work identity separate. It, it's it's the very much the uh, a, a lodestone issue. Um, but I think it also goes back to the point about authentic engagement. Tom used the phrase genuine engagement. And I think the battle we have going forward is how you go from, how you keep that engagement. Engagement itself kind of has a connotation of some rules of engagement. It's not all out hugging each other and loving each other. There's a great study the Swedish innovation agency, <coughs> Vinova did on the modes of e-government going forward. And one is sort of uh, capture. We all hang out in the same forums and we all love each other and share everything. So it's very difficult as a policymaker to make policy when you're intimately involved in the community. And that's, that's a very interesting issue to try and tease out how do you take that step back and use evidence and do it fairly and equitably as well. So it, it, it's, a, it's a large uh, I issue to deal with going forward. On the tactical side, um, you know, just the, the, the point David made about location, I've got a geography degree, I love location. Uh, but I think it's a great way of, of, of um, giving that transparency to what is happening. And it's, you know, we've put um, number 10 on Facebook to allow both people outside the gates, as it were, to find a little bit more about the history of the building, what's happening, plus with uh, PM visits to kind of uh, showcase a little bit more of what's happening, what, what's the announcement was made at this particular location. And good examples, um, you know, both from politicians, uh, Mike Bloomberg in the States uses it to sit, sort of highlight the fact he's on a street, he wants to hear from local traders about the issues with permits. Uh, and also I think with campaigners, uh, Citizens Advice Bureau and some of the homeless charities in Canada are using it to sort of highlight the less glamorous aspects of life. You know, you've, you've checked in this glamorous location, did you know there's 500 rough sleepers within X feet or this is an area where, you know, so and so people are in benefit as well. So I think it just helps widen and makes, makes people more aware of what is happening in the locality, and that's a great thing. So are you, I was just going to ask you, when I was in government, ministers still looked at the, their view of news <coughs> was, first of all, the press cuttings that we handed them every day from Durant, Smashbridge, Wards, which made them look very important because they're all about their department. <laughs> then they listened to the day programme, and we never told them. So this was two years ago. We never told them what was going on in sort of social media. I mean, are they now sort of actively there, sort of worrying about what David's about to unleash at them? And uh, is that kind of where you do your work? Yeah, I think it. I think it varies a lot. You know, as you're saying, it becomes more and more commonplace. Tom was saying, you know, m as we were hearing earlier on, there are more and more people who are on Twitter now. I think that could be reflected. Um, you know, we've got you were saying different. Depends on the age group a lot. I think that can depends a lot on in all MPs, whatever position they might be in. Um, you know, number ten gov is a little bit different because we are there as a kind of corporate account, if you like. And that's another interesting thing in general is you know how corporate accounts we have number ten gov, we have one for the DPM, so we have one for cabinet office. Um, it's a little bit different from those kind of personal accounts, um, but you know it's it's also an interesting kind of way in which we can engage with people. Um, who, who want to engage with us. Um, obviously, the, the questions we have is, how do we engage with all those people? And I know it's a, an issue for, for you guys as well. You know, if you get loads of questions from your constituents, when, when do you choose to engage? If you get, um, you know, comments from your, from your readers, when do you choose to engage with them? There are only so many hours in the day 
any, there's, there's not infinite resource that any of us have for these things these days. So that's, that's, that's a big thing I think that all of us are grappling with. Um, but it's, you know, all, all, all good, good, good cause, I think. Okay, let's go back into the room and get some more questions. And yes, in the back. That's a question and a concern. Uh, the first question is... Can you tell us who you are? Uh, Carl Snowden from Westminster Forum. Um, uh, age has been mentioned uh, quite, quite a lot. And um, I wonder what the panel think of the, uh, the, differ differenti the, the differential between the age demographic of voters, people who actually go and put their X uh, in the box, and those who, Twitter, who tweet, uh, and whether that actually gets in the way of implementing policies that are developed on Twitter if, if it ever gets to that stage. So that's a question and the concern is, I read a book once called The Madness of Crowds. Um, 38 gr gr degrees were uh, trumpeting 900,000, but if it's 900,000 nutters, when is, the next, uh, when is the next campaign for the reintroduction of the death penalty coming about? Thank you. Ros Dunn, Thames Gateway, London Partnership. Um, I think this is actually slightly related to the last point. I often get the sense when I l follow Twitter that actually the um, statistics you get about the different party popularities aren't matched on Twitter. And I have to say I'm happy to say that the government looks a lot less popular on Twitter than it does in most of the polls. And I'm just thinking that when it comes to the next election, should both the political parties be looking at this? And it might be something to do with the demographics and that all these people who hate the government aren't going to vote. But it's just quite interesting that it does look very different. Great. Do you want to come in with any... Yeah, a few from Twitter. Anthony Simon. Is Twitter on the verge of being too big? Hard to find gold nuggets and all that noise and engage properly. Um, the Howard League has tweeted, will it be MPs who actually do the tweeting or actually their tech-savvy interns? Which might be a good one for Tom Watson. Um, and Ben Lyons again, uh, uh, would, it, would it have been more cringe if Gordon Brown had tweeted about the Arctic Monkeys, um, which is in comparison to uh, Ed Balls' tweet about X Factor, and policy exchange, digital government, I think it may have been answered already, but how can we get the civil service to take advantage of, of this opportunity on Twitter? Okay. okay, well let's take some of those. I think there's a really emerging theme here about... Uh, tweeted out a question on Friday before this event <coughs> said, does it really influence policy? And someone was saying, actually, what it does is in, you know, it, it helps people who already have influence, and it doesn't actually help those who don't. So is this just increasing divides uh, rather than sort of you know, drilling really down and increasing uh, democracy and participation? <coughs> and what do you think about the old, the sort of illiterate, and people who probably aren't spending all their life on their uh, you know, sort of five quid a month iPhone tweeting away? Tom, do you? Well, look, I mean, social media is only one channel, uh, and Twitter is one channel within social media. And I, I, last time I checked the age, they, it was people who were broadly sort of in their 30s, uh, the average Twitter user, not young kids who tend to do Facebook or other stuff. Uh, so, I, I mean, if, if, you, if you think that Twitter is in any way representative, then it's a problem for you in policy making, and it's a problem for you in campaigning. And, um, you know, your Twitter feed is what you make of it. Uh, so I've got my digital community, I've got my Labour people, I've got the Conservative guys that I respect and take an interest in, like Tim, uh, and then I've got a big block list of people who shout at me all the time and just ignore. Uh, so, uh, y y you know, you can't, don't, don't think of this, if you, if you start going down the line that this is a representative sample of the nation and therefore I must listen to a, a no club, then you're finished. But I don't think people do. Uh, Howard League, you've been tweeting a lot. I, whoever, you, whoever, whoever the Howard League is, if you're in the room, you're very cynical. Not every MP has got a PR machine, and sometimes they do it in a sort of country sort of way. And my office, all, we, all my interns, and virtually every researcher I've ever had has tried to stop me using social media, <laughs> not the other way around. And, uh, and usually they were right. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, don't, don't think that all MPs get the tea lady to do their tweeting uh, and, and just this sense of place um, just to come back on that geography is really I, I think there is a way that MPs can build communities uh, around place I'm really interested in place I think it's important for political parties as well although part of the I, 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 I don't geolocate myself on um, 
uh, at Twitter or anything like that, mainly because I was followed by private investigators that needed a world tour a long period of time. <laughs> and I, I tried to avoid them, and uh, I find that gives the game away a little bit. Uh, but I do think that, y you know, a politician saying, I'm here, come and find me, uh, you know, I'm here for the next two hours, we're not far away from that. And we're also not far away from people being able to leave messages in geographic spaces for their own communities as well. So I think that's a terrifically exciting part of the development of social media in years to come. So David, 900,000 unrepresentative numbers? Um, well, I, I meet associated group members pretty regularly. And one of the, we do not, as a, as a small office team, rely on the internet to, to, to connect with, with associated group members. It's the community we're trying to serve. We, we recognize that there are limitations in that forum. So we do these things called um, member curries, where we just pick random locations around the UK, email our, all our members in that area and say, our research suggests this is quite a good curry house in, in <laughs> Harlow. Do you come along next next Wednesday? So, and I've, very, I've met very few numbers. Um, tell you a few things about 38 degrees numbers. F first thing, that first assumption that lots of people bring to the 38 degrees community is that we are young. Um, Actually, we pretty closely mirror the UK demographic curve with a slight underrepresentation in the 18 to 24 category. Right. Um, 38 degrees is very popular among, for example, housebound, very elderly people who find that they can engage with issues they care about without being able, to, without having to leave their homes. So sort of mobility mm -hmm. issues. Um, we 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 aren't a youth movement, and I think the days when the internet was it was a youth mm -hmm. movement is, is gone. I think Twitter is probably younger, and that's certainly our sense of 38 degrees for to use. Mm -hmm. Most 38 degrees members do not use Twitter. They're just, any more than they, than they read The Guardian every day, or they're just, they're just a bit more normal than that. Um, <laughs> and we find, that, we find that Facebook is actually, uh, uh, more than half of 38 degrees members use Facebook, something under 20 percent of them use Twitter, which kind of just reflects the general population. I think overall, when, when we ask, we, you know, we give control of 38 degrees to our members to a very large extent. They suggest the campaigns, they vote on the campaigns. We can't run the campaigns unless they take action because that's the only way we campaign. They fund them. And they tend to make very reasonable, very pragmatic decisions mm -hmm. ab about what we campaign on based on a combination of assessing the relative importance of the issue and the, the winnability of it and the principles at stake. Um, uh, like check out our, the conversation on our blog at the moment about, for example, the limitations of that model of choosing campaigns when, when addressing issues that affect mm -hmm. minorities, where a, a disabled 38 degrees member has written a really long blog post about his frustration with what he sees as a popularity contest. It's amazing, and loads, loads and loads of comments. The conversation on Facebook was even more sophisticated and, and lengthy, um, but that's probably dropped down, so you won't see that unless you scroll down a bit. Um, I think the other question, when we engage with that community, to kind of chip in on the, the the challenge that you were talking about. Um, one of the things we've learned um, from engaging with the 38 degrees community is that they don't always expect us to come back on every point. They expect us to host mm -hmm. a conversation amongst their peers and for us to participate mm -hmm. in it like anyone else. And it's like, I think there's that temptation to be like the overactive chair in a meeting that comes back on every single point, when actually what they want to know is just that you're attentive and you're listening. So. I think those 38 degrees members who, who engage with us on Facebook realise that I spend as director minimum half an hour a day con mm. conversing with 38 degrees members on Facebook, mm. often, often more than that. But they don't expect me to come back on everything, they just expect to be part of the, for, for us in the office to be part of the conversation, which is really different and a lot easier as well. Alberto, on this point about who is here, the divide and who's there and who isn't. Um, so I absolutely agree with Tom. That Asking if Twitter is representative of the population is, I think, is a pointless exercise. But if I were to ask you, is the Daily Mail representative of the population? <laughs> is the Guardian? Is Channel 4 News? They're not. Um, they all have their bias. I think the fundamental difference, though, is that from platforms like Twitter, all of those views, from the nutter to all the other views, they don't live in different silos. And walls are broken down, and people are engaging and debating around um, different issues independently of um, the, the, the political bias that they um, start off with. Um, I, also, I think the second point also, actually if you look at the age groups on platforms like Twitter, they're actually much higher than one would probably assume. There are quite a few people who are in higher um, age brackets. 
And I think the point actually links very closely to the left versus right on Twitter. My suspicion is that Twitter feels to you more left-wing because you, you probably follow more people who have similar political affiliation to yours and who re retweet people who say things that they tend to agree with, so you see more of those messages. I think that studies have shown that Twitter as a whole is probably more liberal-leaning, but I think it's far less than we realize. There are many, many more views, but because we engage in groups, a limited number of groups, we tend to engage more with people who are more aware of people that we have similar... Yeah, what, what's come back on you? But I need a microphone. So. No, 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 because otherwise we can't hear you anyway. Okay, I won't try shouting. Um, I would have, I probably do follow more left-leaning groups, but actually this was an observation from following hashtags like things like BBC QT or The Mar Show or things like that. And so those, I think, are not just people I choose. And you do, if you do it, you find that you get a lot more people very, very hostile to government policy than yeah, to I Labour. I think there are, there are lots of people on the other side of the outside as well, very hostile to left-leaning politics. I think in general, probably the needle is more, um, is tending more towards the liberal side. Um, but, you know, uh, to give uh, one example, in the US there are more Republican politicians than um, Democrat politicians on, on Twitter. Um, I think while it is leaning that way, I think it's much less than lots of people realize because of the people they engage with or, you know, the programs that they watch or don't watch. I think there's also a lot, a, a lot of people who are being challenged into government of the day because, yes, of, because of the government yeah. of the day. And that's very true. People assume that that's a Bible. But, but, but <coughs> for example, we reckon between 20 and 25 percent of thirty-eight Greek members voted mm. Conservative at the last election. But they're, 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 but they're also the kind of people who like to be engaged between mm. elections and challenge and speak up about the policies that they don't like. And that often gets assumed by politicians to be a tribal lefty thing or something. But Fringes, it's, 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 you know, it's the front seat of big voters. And yeah. bring tyranny in with its sort of, you know, left-wing issues, let's call. Um, well, I, I think if you look at the latest YouGov polling, you will find that you know if voters are given a, a fourth choice between you know, would you like a government led by Ed Miliband or David Cameron, you know, David Cameron leads, I think, by about five points at, at the moment. It's exactly the same in Finian poll. You ask them whether they approve <coughs> or disapprove of the government. The people disapproving are sort of 30 percent greater than the people approving. So I think there, what you're picking up, you may still be right. It might be a left-wing bias, but I think there is a difference, as I think David has said, between being left-wing and being pro or anti-government. Uh, just, just briefly, because I think most points have been covered. But the, um, in terms of the representativeness of Twitter or blogging or whatever for that matter, I always get Tory MPs who read the comments underneath one of their threads that they, you know, blog that they've written and uh, they, they're sometimes not happy, sometimes <laughs> delighted and I always say they never believe that the quantity of a particular number of comments either anti or uh, for you is, is representative. You know, judge comments on the quality of the arguments that, that they, they contain and nothing else because again and again we had this recently, we had a, some threads on legalising drugs and nearly every single commenter was in favour of drug decriminalisation. You just run a poll of Conservative Party members and find, interestingly, actually, it's very split. You may just think that Tory members were against these things, but it's very split. But it was incredibly different from the, um, the, the comments. And so I always say never judge threads by the volume of one side or another, just on the quality of arguments, or the poor quality of arguments, it's even worse. Is there any good advice for a civil servant who might want to tweet without going and taking sort of, you know, sort of helpful guidance on how you may remain completely anonymous on Twitter or oh dear, you know, the shortcomings in trying to do it. And I follow one colleague, actually, one former colleague at Zephyr, who actually tweets really interestingly and I think completely faithfully, apart from once when Harry Summer got yes. upset that he tweeted that there was a mop infestation in Zephyr, which he didn't watch, but actually about <laughs> actually what his, what his job is, which is actually quite interesting like going after councils and all those sorts of things, which is very insightful. And actually, <coughs> I don't think there's any problems for anyone, but I don't know. If I absolutely agree. Problems? I think if, as long as um, you know, rules aren't broken, and I think the great value is this 
for people on providing these slightly today, let's just say do they work? And I think in terms of the mosque mm -hmm. instance, in the station example, that, you know, someone can get angry about it, but it happens. And there's you know, information that you can share in terms of whether or not if you don't talk about it, it didn't happen, it actually did happen. Um, so I think in general there is um, great value as long as you know, there are rules that seem to be respected. Yes. Just, just building on that, you. Out of someone, they're trying to lose their job, have I? No, do I? I tweet publicly. Many of my colleagues also tweet publicly. Um, you, we were involved in developing the guidelines, working with Tom when he was the cabinet office minister, um, and you know, having a short, pithy set is very useful mm -hmm. for for people to know which way is up and which way is forward. Um, there's always colleagues that want want the guide rails, not just the guidelines, but actual you know, handle up the mm -hmm. staircase. Um, so we've, we've been helping them do that. Um, more recently, the New Zealand government took uh, some of our guidance and have reworked it, and I think they've addressed the, the whole sort of uh, work versus personal um, issue a bit more, uh, and it's an evolutionary process. So again, that's one of those connections you make over social media, and so, so the work has been passed on, and hopefully it'll come back uh, a bit further developed. You know, when I was a minister, and my biggest problem to get civil servants onto social media was IT managers restricted access to social media. Fir firstly, they did it on grounds of, uh, you, you know, management. You, you can't possibly be on social media and doing your job. You know, it's like the 1970s when you had to put your hand up and make a long-distance phone call from the office on the telephone. You, you know, they didn't see Facebook as a tool in which you can organise project groups or share information really quickly or get insights. Uh, and then <coughs> when that argument was debunked, they would then say, oh, well, you know, security, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, you know, and I, I, in the end, I kind of just gave up, uh, which is what ministers tend to do when they're banging their head against the wall. Uh, so the biggest challenge is cultural change. It's not, it's not, um, it, it, it's, it's not, the, it's not uh, civil servants wanting to, not, not wanting to do this stuff. I just think they need permission to do so and they need some strong leadership from the head, heads of the civil service who are frankly very small t conservative in all of this area. Okay, any final questions in the room? Anyone with last minute? Ryan, quickly, microphone. Um, I'm undecided about Twitter as a, a tool for trying to dominate the agenda and whether spin is becoming more a vortex or whether in fact it's as it were being anaesthetized. I mean, the political parties can go direct now. They don't need the mainstream media, but they will then get a reply. When do they try to, do they continue replying? Does the dialogue continue? Does anybody win? What's happening with Twitter and spin? So I think let's, we're gonna have to end up there. So last comments from all the panel on, on Brian's point, perhaps the point, is Twitter raising the quality of the policy debate? Yeah. Um, you know, is it a nice countervailing yeah. force, or is it yeah. diminishing Twi it? Twitter is the antidote to spin. If you put a story in a, in a paper that is lacking in factual accuracy, you get murdered on Twitter t two hours later. And believe me, I've done that. And uh, I don't do it anymore because I get murdered on Twitter if I do it. Uh, I don't think political parties have quite managed to work out that Twitter is really, you know, it is about an authentic voice, whether you're fragile or, you, you know, your, your, in, your inadequacies come over as well as your strength. And that's, that's where, that's the game, I think. And, um, you know, you've still got to learn that lesson. But I, the, the, you, you, I don't think you can do spin on Twitter. David. I think you probably can do spin on Twitter. <laughs> I think it can, be, it can be petty and childish and mean and tribal uh, and amplify distortion well as that. However, I do think it's a net benefit, particularly when taken together with the other bits of the digital engagement tool set, um, which the net, the net benefit is that more people can get involved and have a say and ensure that ideas aren't missed and conversations aren't had and that bad policy is called out. Um, and overall, it makes things a bit ma more chaotic and a bit more messy, but it probably makes for better decisions. Alberta, on, on average. On average. <laughs> You sound like a politician there, David. <laughs> <laughs> I On think it makes um, spin news much, much harder because you have lots of fact checkers, as Tom said, lots of people who will um, counter your arguments. I think the key element to add to that is also that the media will then pay attention to those arguments, pick them up, and distribute them within their own um, publications or 
within our news channel. So amplifying them beyond um, Twitter itself, making spin even harder. I think a good example is the recent um, Paul Fane versus Alistair Campbell around the um, Levinson inquiry. And how the way that story developed and the fact that you know, how did the um, testimony get out, the fact that it was shared mm -hmm. with um, three people, you had the, at least the, the, the debate was out there and it happened um, in public. And I think social media played a big part in terms of outlining the whole process behind um, what happened around that story. Good point. Well, the government has really got the space to make really difficult and quite sophisticated choices between things. I mean, you know, say Boris, well, actually, you know, what other, where else are you going to cut the DEFRA budget and stuff like that? No, does Twitter help make those sophisticated choices or does it oversimplify? Wow. Um, I, think, I think Twitter is, <coughs> although talking to people in ministry, um, they find Twitter incredibly useful as, a, as an early warning system mm. um, for issues that perhaps their civil servants or the national press haven't picked up and that the Twitter gives them a clue as to what people are, are thinking about. Um, the general view, the sort of broader view that I hear from government uh, towards Twitter and social media generally is that um, you know, a lot of it they find is a sewer. You know, this is the one thing we haven't covered tonight is the ugliness of, of, of huge parts of Twitter. Um, and the other I, I sort of think thing is that um, uh, Twitter is, um, it, it's, a, it's what, uh, I mentioned one of your friends, Tom, to finish, uh, and it's uh, Andy Colston said when he, before when he was still a, head of Downing Street, uh, head of Tory communications, he said the biggest challenge we're going to face in government is the rapidity of the new cycle. And uh, how everything happens so quickly now, and how do you, how do you manage that? And I think at the same time, it um, makes everything seem so much more important at the time, and then everything so much less important 24 hours afterwards. And the great real and difficulty for politicians is to know which is the thing that will last in the memory and which is the thing that, that needs to be forgotten. And I don't know whether so much of everything at the moment seems to happen quickly and be forgotten. Now, I don't know whether that is a product of the media that we now have or whether it's a, uh, it's a product of the fact that actually the big thing that's happening in the world economy is incredibly big and therefore all the small things don't matter. Now, I'm not sure whether this uh, trivialization of so much stuff is a function of that big elephant making everything else feel small, or whether it's actually the media cycle is making everything small, and I don't think politicians quite know the answer to that. That's a brilliant point on which to end. Um, first of all, could we thank our terrific panelists tonight? So, can we all thank you? Thank you. I just want to advertise the next in the series, which is perhaps back to old spin. Um, but on the 24th of January, we have Alistair Campbell and Chris Mullen coming and talking in the next one in this series on, uh, I think, provisionally entitled Ministers and the Media. Um, with Alistair Campbell now saying ministers pay too much attention to the media, which I think is sort of interesting to think how that is. Um, Alistair, of course, is a prolific blogger and tweeter, uh, so we can pick up some of the themes today. And finally, I'd like to invite you all outside for drinks, etc. And again, to thank Trish Ben Hedges for their sponsorship of this event. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.